If you listen to the show, you already know that we cannot exist without our sponsors. They are the ones who make things happen behind the scenes. So let's acknowledge Fuji Sports. We've been working with these guys for a while now, not only as far as this podcast is concerned, but also at the Roll Academy. We've had their gear. I personally use their geese. What a phenomenal product. Yeah, I mean, jujitsu, judo, MMA, um, tape, bags, anything you need for your jujitsu journey. You can find at fujisports.com. Let's talk Roll TV. There's so much content on there. It's ridiculous at this point. But I think what is even more intriguing, as time went on during the project, we've been recording most of the events that were taking place here at Roll Academy. At this point, I mean, we have guys like Chris Howder, Armin Fadi, Rafael Lovato Sr., and, and Pete the Greek. I mean, there were so many different events that we've kind of recorded it. Don't you think that's amazing? I mean, points of reflection and kind of going back for all the students to see what really happened and refresh their memory. Yeah, I think it's great, you know, being able to go back and look at all these high-level practitioners, uh, Octavio Kudo, like uh, one of the names you didn't mention. And I mean, just these guys that have been doing this for so long come in, uh, teach these amazing seminars and workshops, and it's all recorded and there for you to watch. Yeah, absolutely. So if you want to get the additional savings on all this, type in code ROW Radio at the coupon and get additional 30% off of your membership. Nice. Go to rollacademy.tv. What's up, everyone, and welcome back. If you haven't already, please remember to hit the like, share, subscribe, download, listen, and whatever other button there is, and leave us a review wherever you do listen. That ensures that we can continue bringing you the great guests and amazing content that you have come to expect. Today's guest has earned himself a number of recognitions over his years on the mats, most notably being the first person promoted to black belt by Haja Gracie. Nicholas Gregoriatis was the co-founder of the massive affiliation, the Jiu-Jitsu Brotherhood, and now is running Subconscious Jiu-Jitsu Academy out of Hollywood, California. Nick joins us to discuss his grappling journey that took him from South Africa to the UK to America. Here is the Roll Radio with author, instructor, entrepreneur, and Haja Gracie black belt, Nicholas Gregoriatis. Welcome to Roll Radio. <laughs> and we are live. Yeah, here we go. <laughs> uh, we're just doing the triple check on that everything. We haven't not recorded something in a very long we, time. We haven't screwed but, up in a while. Uh, but we're still scared of doing it. Yeah. So, um, uh, it yeah. was a little scared with your card earlier today. but Oh, yeah. If anybody, any of you other podcasters out there who have a road, you know about the, the card that goes in the back. And it's like <laughs> I, it's like putting, um, I don't know, it's, it's so tiny. And if you don't put it in just right it falls in yeah. and then you can't get it out <laughs> so uh when you when you're doing that it's 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 stressful it's very stressful yeah right? um yeah. but whatever it's no big deal so we've been getting some feedback from from different people around the world and um yeah. you want to read one of them out today right well yeah you know we're doing tell us your favorite episode uh and if we pick your submission randomly uh you get a uh t-shirt and you also get a little bit of roll tv um, and today's winner is John Cadle and, uh, John, his favorite episode was, uh, probably a lot of people's. It was here in Gracie. Yep. Uh, and his, what, what really resonated with him was, uh, he runs always, uh, keep it playful. Uh, and that mindset, even when he was getting backlash from the family and, and other people that he really believes, you know, to, to keep your jujitsu place playful. So John, uh, look for an email from me because, uh, we need your home address to get you the shirt. Um, so please keep an eye out, uh, for an email from me. Outstanding. And if I'm not mistaken, he runs the most listened episode at this point, right? I mean, uh, you know, yeah, I had, I, I had I'm it open sure. a minute I'm, ago. I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure, sure it is. It is. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, know Henry, I wonder why Henry Atkins kind of was <laughs> Henry Atkins was leading for, was leading for a while, and now uh, he ran bumped up, and uh, I think he's in the front over there. But uh, yeah, what, what can, a great conversations! Yeah, for sure. And I, I we we really have to. Yes, it is Henry's uh, number two. I apologize, Henry. Uh, <laughs> and we have to have Henry back because uh, um, we've had more fun about that episode after <laughs> than we had actually recording it. Yeah, so we need to two. have Henry back. Round two. Yep. All right, let's get started. Well, let's let's have another great conversation. 
Uh, Nick, how are you? How is your cat doing, um, by the way? <laughs> <laughs> He's good. He's good. This cat is like, I never knew it was possible to love an animal as much as I love this cat. It's crazy. What, what's, what's, so, what's so special about the cat that you resonate so much? Well, I don't think there's anything necessarily special about um, this cat. Uh, I just, when I choose to love something, I, I can't love by half measures. I, I love it with every ounce of my being. And that's, uh, he's the lucky recipient at the moment. <laughs> the lucky recipient. I like that. I like that. Well, you know, it, it, your journey, it, it is so rich. It is, um, you know, as I was educating myself and kind of reading all about you, um, y you are one of the earlier guys to start the association idea all around. You're saying I'm old, basically. <laughs> well, I didn't want to say in so many I words, am, I am. <laughs> <laughs> but I, listen, I'm right behind you. Okay. I'm right behind you. So, um, but, but why did this start to create this brotherhood? Why did this start to create this bond between different organization and different schools um, to, to share this, this beautiful thing that we, we love a lot as a jiu-jitsu. I think, uh, Thomas, it's, it's the natural progression or the natural evolution for human beings is you start off by, we, we naturally want to progress and evolve uh, our skills and our abilities and we want to grow. So, you know, I had done a lot of stuff in jiu-jitsu up to that point and competed and got my black belt and taught and, the next progression is naturally to, you know, like extend further, like broaden everything. So it was, it was the logical progression to start my, excuse me, my own association. Um, but also like, I was just kind of, I just, I didn't gel with what I saw with a lot of the other organizations was uh, this, like this tribal mentality, you know, it's us versus them. And it's like, my team versus your team. I just thought that was kind of stupid, to be honest. Um, and so when I started Jiu-Jitsu Brotherhood, uh, which is no longer running, by the way, I just should make it clear, like I, I don't have any involvement with that anymore. But when I started it, like the, the core of it was like, no politics, no bullshit, you know, like anyone can join. If they want to be a part of it. And uh, that, was, that was the ethos behind it. What I think at that, at that time when this was those anchoring and starting from the ground is it was very much so against the grain, if you will. I mean, there was a lot of these organizations, which you just mentioned a moment ago, which they had very strict rules and they were very anchored in their own ways. And then you are introducing this thing that is very opposite of that. Yeah, uh, I think it was yeah probably one of the first things to to kind of have that ethos, but. Um... There were a couple of others at the time, and now it's really that that idea started to gain momentum, which is it's it's good to see. It's always good to have your your ideas uh, validated or vindicated, you know, later in your life. Do you think that that contributed to jujitsu what it is today? That free flowing kind of um, organization or group of individuals without these strict rules and. Um, limitations, if you will? Yeah, I think to a degree, yeah. I mean, probably not a huge amount, but I'm sure. Uh, look, uh, the books and videos and, and stuff was were viewed by hundreds of thousands of people, and I always made it clear like that that's what I was about. So I think more than a few people were influenced by that. But, um, you know, to say, like, that it is it responsible for what jiu-jitsu is today would be, like, definitely a, a leap. Well, you're very humble, but I think there is an impact that was made. Uh, so what what, Thanks, brings, what brings about this philosophy? Is it um, like all the traveling you've done, all, or was that something that was organic in you from from prior to that? Uh, probably about 20 years ago, I started to become aware of uh, the philosophy that you know, beneath everything, beneath this physical world that we see, there's this interconnected web of energy that we are all, which connects all of us, right? I mean, it's, and I, I really do believe that. Uh, it's my perspective that we are all 
we all came from the same thing and we all returned to the same thing, right? So the process of individuation is, is necessary, but ultimately it's not all there is to life. And I've, I've found in my own experience, it's when I was most separate from other people and when I put the biggest boundaries up and created the biggest differentiation between myself and others that I was the most unhappy and most disconnected. And so, uh, you know, it was just, to me, it made, I really believe everything you do, you should align it with your values and your beliefs, right? That's how you get the most power. Or that's how you are the most effective. And so it was just natural for me to align what I was wanting to do with my Jiu-Jitsu association with my belief system. Is that translate, continuously translating to what you're doing today? You said you're not, you're, you're not directly involved with Jiu-Jitsu Brotherhood at this point of time, but... You st you you're still very much involved in jiu-jitsu. Is that how you view jiu-jitsu today? Yeah, funny enough, my my association now is called Subconscious Jiu-Jitsu, mm -hmm. and uh, I, I think you could you could make a you could draw a parallel between the subconscious, uh, which is or the collective subconscious, the collective unconscious, where all of our all of our individual dreams and hopes and beliefs and thoughts are all aggregated and stored basically in some universal cloud um and then we are just these little individual nodes that, that upload and download from that and so yeah i guess you, you could draw a parallel for sure where does all this started where, where's the beginning of all those where where, where reach back <laughs> like, reach back over here right? give, give us a little glimpse of what's going on back there can you can you be a bit more specific with the question when you say where did all of this start like what what are you referring to specifically well let's start with where did your jiu-jitsu start? Let's start from the very beginning. Do you remember your first day? Do you remember the first time you got yeah. your first interaction? Uh, yeah, my first interaction was, was actually with judo, and I was seven years old. Uh, there was a, at my, uh, my school, I was in grade two, and my best friend at the time, I remember, I actually remember this very clearly, he was getting a ride back with me and my mom in the car back from school. And he was telling my mom that he was doing judo. And I was like, I want to do judo. So um, I started training after school a couple of times a week. There was this, this old Dutch guy. This was in South Africa. And there was this old Dutch guy. I still remember his name. His name was Mr. Sukkel. And he, uh, he was teaching judo. And uh, I just went along and I absolutely loved it. And I think that started... Well, at least it was part of my start, it was part of the start of my fascination with martial arts. You know, um, when I was a kid, I wasn't a very, I wasn't a very strong or athletic kid. And I think one of the things that people love about martial arts, I heard something many years ago, which is that no one who feels whole and complete starts martial arts, right? Martial arts is only started by people who feel lacking in some way. And throughout martial arts is this idea that you can become more than what you are, that you can accelerate or um, amplify your progress and, and become something greater than what you are. And so to me, as this little kid, who was, you know, came from a difficult home, home life and I wasn't very athletic or strong. And I just, I felt pretty disenfranchised. And that's what, that's what uh, martial arts was. That was the draw. And, um, I did judo for, for several years. I think when I was about 14 or 15, I kind of fell away from it. Um, and then when I was uh, 19, I started doing some, there was a, like an MMA type academy in, in South Africa that my brother and I went along to. And it was basically just submission grappling, like with a little bit of open hand striking, like the pancreation rules. So I started training that for a little bit. And then, um, then I moved to London and I wanted to continue training. And I, that's where I found myself at Roger Grace's Academy and, and continue to train with him there in London. Take me back to that beginning judo time. What is so fascinating about judo that draws you in for seven, seven years, right? From seven to 14? Yeah. Uh, that's a long time to train. Yeah. I mean, it was on and off. It, it was on and off. Like, you know, one, one grade, I would be doing it a lot. The next grade, I wouldn't, I wouldn't train much. So um, I think what, what really, uh, so I'll tell you a story. I, I will never forget this. So long as I live, it is one of the key moments of my life. I was uh, seven years old 
And it was the end of the judo class. And what the guy used to do, what Mr. Sukkot used to do at the end of the judo class, he used to line up, he used to make two teams, split the class into two, make two teams, and he would line one team up. They would all kneel down on one edge of the mat, and then the other team would all kneel down on the other edge of the mat. And basically, then you would fight. You'd have like a little a little uh, competition, right? A little exhibition, exhibition match with the guy directly opposite you. And all the other kids would sit there and watch and, you know, cheer for what, whatever was happening for their, for their guy or cheer against the other guy. And I was paired up with this guy named Christopher, Christopher Hill. And I remember Christopher Hill was the older brother of a friend of mine. Um, and I knew I couldn't beat this guy. I was like, this guy's bigger and stronger. And like, he'd beat me a lot of times before. And, uh, <laughs> um, we started this match and it was, it was very, um, it was actually kind of even, it was very stale. We were like just tugging and pulling. And I think he tripped me and he scored a, a Coco and I was tired, but I was hanging in there, hanging in there. And I remember there was like 30 seconds to go. And, um, now excuse me, goosebumps to think about it. <laughs> and I just, I threw like a hail Mary and I, I did like the Ogoshi, the hip toss. And I'll never forget, like, Mr. Sukkul instantly went like, Ipon, like, that was it. Like, I threw this guy for Ipon, and it was, it was just like, fucking gives me goosebumps right now. It was like magic. It was like magic. And uh, that's the thing that always keeps me coming back, right? Is that, like, you know what it's like to do too when it's, when it's done well. It's like magic. You know, you can, it all comes together, your heart, your mind, your body, your movement, and you can just do something really amazing. And that's, I mean, that's why I still do it, to be honest. For one of the reasons. I mean, moments like this oftentimes define the path of what happens after that and what we do, how we approach, especially a big concept, a big idea like martial art. I mean, you've been on the mat for decades at this point, and it appears to me as an outsider that this could be one of those defining moments where the there is this opportunity where things are against me and yet you maneuver through these obstacles and you are able to achieve some of the goals that sometimes even appear not to be reachable. Yeah. And I think that's what uh, a lot of us crave, right? Like that's the narrative that we're fed as well. If you watch all, all superhero movies, that's what, that's what happens, right? Like the guy gets taken. I was just watching this morning, my favorite scene from any movie ever, which is a uh, Avengers end game where Captain America is like, alone and he's just been beaten up by Thanos and then like he finds the will to get up and then his his armies eventually join him and he they win the battle but like that's what um I think that's yeah he, when the, the human experience the human ride like if you look back it's those moments of struggle and those moments where you overcome that are the ones that are most treasured and are most valued is that how you look at martial arts in general, even decades later, where we we do find ourselves in these mat, th these moments on the mat where we have these obstacles, that these problems that we have to solve between us and our partners, these situations that we have to maneuver through, and we have to continue troubleshooting, even though sometimes it appears as it's unsolvable or it's almost impossible, we continue chipping away at it. And is that the beautiful part behind the martial art or jiu-jitsu in general for you? That's a great question. To me, that's, that is a, a great part, but the, the part that, that keeps me in it, um, you know, and, and I say this, I used to be like hesitant to say this, but the fact is like the actual component of, of sparring with people, it, it's, it's at the point now, I don't know how old you guys are, but I'm, I'm almost 44 years old and, but it's just, I can actually feel that it's not good for me. That's the truth. I can feel jujitsu sparring is just not good for me. But the reason I still do it is to me, the sparring element of jujitsu is the, the price I pay to get to go and hang out with my friends and students on the mat. It's literally like a, it's like a deal I make. It's like, okay, I'll stand, I'll stay on the mat. I'll keep training so that I can be around these people because that is the beauty of it. It's hanging out with these amazing people. I mean, I don't say it to brag, but I've got so many amazing friends that came from jujitsu, like incredible people all over the world that like have enriched my, my life and my human experience so much. And it's because jujitsu is a very special thing. Like 
when you roll around on the, with the guy on the floor trying to strangle him and he's trying to bend your leg the wrong way or whatever. And then at the end, you know that guy. You, it's real. Like you, It's not like some weird business relationship where you don't know if this guy's trying to steal something from you or being fake or it's, it's not, nah, dude, it's real. You get to know that guy there and then. And that to me is, is the best thing. It's just the relationships by far. That is the, that is the best thing about jujitsu to me. We had, we had some time ago, we had Dracolino here on the, on the show with a conversation. And he, one of the things that he mentioned that I remember was the fact that main reason behind the close bond between all of us on the mat is the fact that we entrust our partner with not only the physical pressure that they are going to put on, but also some of these compromised positions that they are putting ourselves in. And mm -hmm. by doing so, we, we developed this very quick trust and relationship. And if that is guided properly, it really some strong relationships can be created from it. I don't know about you, but I don't know many people outside of jiu-jitsu. Like, I, I, I just, I just kind of don't. All my friends, everybody, the entire mm -hmm. circle is kind of jiu-jitsu and somehow jujitsu connected. Um, do you find yourself in the same same boat? Yeah, and I think uh, regarding what you said earlier about it's this this trusting, you know, that's why when you get the like every now and then like there'll be some douchebag who just like hurts people, right? And that's why jujitsu spits him out sooner or later. Just like it just spits him out because no one wants that. No one wants to have to be like, oh shit, what's this guy going to do to me today? Like, yeah. Um, yeah, I absolutely agree with you. It's, uh, I heard, I think I, I spoke about this on another podcast, which is something I heard that was really fascinating was that um, apparently the, the bond that is formed by two uh, people, who, who, two comrades two, uh, in, in combat, two soldiers that are fighting on the same team is, is apparently on a spiritual level even more powerful than a bond that is formed between family members, between a father and a son or like a, husband and a wife. It's the most powerful connection that, that a soul can like experience is going into battle with another soul. Right. And it's related to this idea that the intensity of the relationship is very closely related or, or correlated to the intensity of the emotional experiences, which surround that particular relationship. So if you're at work and you're in a cubicle, just filling out a spreadsheet and you have a colleague who sits next to you, doing the same thing and all you ever do is just exchange spreadsheets or you know talk about the weather that relationship is never really going to reach any sort of height but if you're wrestling with a guy on the mat and he's got you in a bow and arrow choke and you're holding on holding on and then like eventually you escape and you both laugh together or the, the clock goes off and you both chuckle it like that that forms a bond that's like mm. that's a real thing you know and that's why i believe why jiu-jitsu facilitates um intense and, and blasting relationships hold on are you suggesting that we should have little fights in the cubicles <laughs> sure <laughs> i wanted to choke a few people in cubicles before no, no I'm, I'm suggesting you should not be in the cubicle bro to be honest <laughs> just want to make that <laughs> sort of no. clarify that yeah. uh but you know you're right the the these bonds that we create oftentimes are stronger and um you know they they are by far longer lasting you know, at least like in my case, I, I, I know so many people in jiu-jitsu and some of them, you know, through this, through this medium as we are connecting today and others on the mat and, and so on. But, but, but this, this jiu-jitsu community is something unique um, that I've never seen anywhere else. And so it's, it's beautiful that we are able to share this. After, yeah, seven, really after seven years of judo, you were introduced to MMA grappling, you know, a flavor of it. Um, that continues now for a few years, and then you're moving to Europe. What causes that move? Why are you moving over continents? Uh, yeah, so yeah, so I trained this this like pancreation and stuff for a couple of years, and I was pretty good at it. I remember thinking, wow, I'm like, I have a, an affinity for this. Um, and then, you know, like in South Africa, at the, South Africa is a very small place. It's very isolated. It's kind of backward, to be honest. Um, and you know, I grew up watching American television, uh, listening to American music, playing American and Japanese video games. You know, like I just, when I was doing uh, judo with Mr. Sukul, he used to talk about Japan. And like, from a young age, I was just like, man, I got to get the fuck out of this place. Like, that's, that was my mentality. I was like, this place is too small. Like, it's just, and so 
for a lot of young people, myself included, it was just a natural progression. You, you would leave South Africa and you would go and spend a year abroad, usually in, in England, because there was a reciprocal relationship between the United Kingdom and South Africa, because South Africa was a former colony, so you could apply for a one-year working visa. Um, and the truth is, I actually didn't want to go to to England. I wanted to go to America. That was my thing. Like I wanted, I wanted to get to America, but at that point, I couldn't really see a way to get there. You couldn't just arrive in America and live there. You know, you had to have. It's just more complicated, as I'm sure you guys know. But I had a, a Greek passport, which allowed me to go to Europe for as long as I wanted to. So I went to to Europe because I just realized there was just I could feel I could feel my soul was telling me, "Oh, this you got to go. You got to expand your horizons." So yeah, man, I got to I got to England, and um, I started training with Roger, which was I always look back. That was another pivotal moment. Like there was another place I was looking at to train. I didn't really know much about Roger. He wasn't he wasn't famous then. Um, and one of my friends from South Africa who used to train with me had moved to England the year before, and he said, "Oh, you should come try come to Roger's academy." So there was actually a place closer to my house that I was going to go to, and I decided. No, let me just go, like, let me go check out this other place. My friend Robbie is training there. Let me go check it out. And I remember getting there, and I, I knocked on the door. And, you know, at this point, I'd watched UFC, the UFCs. What year is and it? This was 2003 or 2004, I think okay, 2004. So, so how so is getting up there at this, at this point? He's not famous, famous, but he's paving his, his path at this point. Yeah, look, I mean... He had obviously won brown belts right. up to brown belts in all in, in jiu jitsu, but I mean, like, he hadn't won ADCC, he hadn't won right. the absolute. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? It wasn't like a, like a household name in the jiu jitsu community yet. Like, most people wouldn't know who most people would know who, who Hickson was or Hoist, but they wouldn't know who Roger was right, at this mm-hmm. point. So, um, you know, he opened the door, and I was like, I didn't know who it, I didn't recognize him. It was just this like skinny looking kid, really, like this tall, skinny looking kid. And also, I was expecting like the the skin tone of like Hoyt or, or Hickson, you know, that like darker skin tone, like dark hair, dark features. So I was like, "Hey, man, I'm I'm looking for Roger Gracie," <laughs> and um, and he said, "That's me." So I was like, "Oh no, shit, cool, man. Well, yeah, I, I just wanted to come try it out." And so, um, you know, he was just the most. I say this often, you know, like there's a lot of hero worship in jiu-jitsu and a lot of people make the mistake of they equate people's ability on the jiu-jitsu mat with their character and morals and their actualization as a human being. And very often those things aren't even correlated, right? Like a lot of good jiu-jitsu guys are, I hate to say it, but they're douchebags. They're arrogant and selfish and immoral and they're just not good people. But I can say with total sincerity that roger is really one of the best human beings i know like if you've met him you understand he's just got such a good vibe there's no airs or graces he's generous he's kind he's just like a wonderful human being and i remember him showing me such great kindness like i couldn't actually afford to train at the academy and he just like he said don't worry about it you know and i actually never paid to train at his academy i trained there for years i never paid i mean i would help out i would teach classes and clean up stuff and i would i would you know i would do my share but like that to me was always, I look at my life, that was a pivotal moment. It could have gone very differently if I'd gone to that other academy. Um, my life would have been completely different. There's no doubt about that. Yeah, it's it's great to hear that. And I see, uh, Gary, I don't know about you, but I see the correlation between what Nick is talking about, Hodger, and his dad. We had his dad. I was dad, just to say that. Yeah, we that's we so had much. his dad some time ago. I was looking up to see a, a what year episode ago or so. Was. Yeah. And, and it's similar, that kindness and softness of the conversation that we had with him it was quite quite mind mind blowing, and I'm pretty sure that you guys have met, you know, at your at your stay there. So, um, yeah, I know Mauricio very well. He's yeah, a lovely man, yeah, very funny. Yeah, yeah Mauricio, what a, what a great stories we had in a conversation with him. So all this is starting. I mean, you you, you hey, what's up? This is Hodger, and and kind of you know, <laughs> an awkward awkward in a way beginning of that story, and it evolves into, um. Beyond a friendship, yes, no. You know, with with Roger, like, yeah, I would, I would definitely say we're friends, but like, there's always a. Now we're much better friends than we were then because, look, man, I'm this 
guy who's wanting to get good at this thing. He's the best of the best at this thing. I'm his training partner. I kind of work for him as well because I'm teaching at the academy. Like, it's, it, you know, it's not as clear as, oh, we're just buddies. Like, there's, there's more to that relationship. You know what I mean? So I think he always kept me at a bit of arm's length, and I always did the same with him, you know? And we hung out a few times, and, you know, but now it's cool. I see him a couple of times a year. We teach us retreat together in Northern California, and we, we always talk about the old days, and we joke around, and it's like, and now I consider him a very close friend. Um, but back then, it was like, it was a little bit more complicated than that. At any point in a given time, do you realize the magnitude of who are you surrounded by? Oftentimes, these moments define who we are and how we treat the situations, and that's what defines us, who we become in the future. You do have an opportunity to train and hang out and pick the brain of arguably the best out of the best out of the best out there. Do you see that at that point of time? It was actually 2005 when Roger won ADCC. That's when I knew. That's when I was like, okay, this dude, like this, there's uh, something different about this guy. And that was the point. Actually, I remember I had a girlfriend at the time and she wanted to go back to South Africa. She'd come with with me. And I said to her, like, I said, like, do you get that I'm training with the best of the best? Like, this is the best guy to do this thing ever. And like, I'm, I'm here training with him. Like, do you realize what an opportunity this is? And so, yeah, that was the point, Thomas, um, 2005, right after you won ADCC. What a memorable, another pivot point. So it's like we're going through your life sure. stories. There are those anchor points, which yeah. you've been given. Yeah, there's, there's a bunch of them. Yeah. There's a bunch of them, yeah. If you had to define one, the one that made the biggest impact, the, 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 the one turn that you made in your life, do you have one in your mind that really defined who you are today and what you do? Um, this is a handful, but there's two. If I have to narrow it down, I would say there's two. Uh, the first one was was when I, I went to um, Peru to drink ayahuasca in December 2012. That was that was a a really really big pivoting point. Like I was never the same after that. And then the the next one was uh, my divorce in 2021, uh, end of 2020. Um, that with those two things, like if I look back at the most influential experiences or events in my life, I would have to say it was those two for sure. What was what was so pivotal about the trip to Peru? Uh, I mean, have you done ayahuasca before? I, I, <laughs> I have not. <laughs> okay, yeah. So, um, it's kind of, in that case, it's kind of hard to explain, but um, it's just, uh, you know, plant medicine has this way of really shaking up your perceptions and what you believe, uh, what you believe about the world, right? Like it, it you know, it's this very powerful concoction that alters your brain chemistry in such a way. And I believe it's working on a bunch of deeper levels, not just physiologically and psychologically, it's also working on your soul and the the events and the experiences and the things that I was shown and the things that I saw, like, I just, it just wasn't the same after that. Like I just, I remember I came back to London and I couldn't live in London anymore. I just, I could feel my frequency and the frequency of that city were just incompatible. So I left. Um, And yeah, that, it's it's kind of, I mean, that, that would be a two-hour conversation in itself, to be honest, Thomas. But needless to say, it, it changed the way I looked at the, at the world, for sure. Fair enough. So life is unfolding, you're training, you're in London, and at some point of time, you decide to create this organization, uh, Jiu-Jitsu Brotherhood. When is the starting? What is the idea here? Why, 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 where's the, 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 the seed that gets planted behind that? Yeah, it's quite a, it's quite a weird story. <laughs> um, I remember I was, it was, uh, I think it was a, I can't remember what day of the week it was, but there was a, a class, a jiu-jitsu class. And one of my teachers, one of the instructors at Rogers Academy, his name was Felipe really good teacher, really influential. 
in my in my career and i i was really stoned i was at that point in life i was smoking a lot of weed i'd never smoked weed up until this point and i think i was around 26 or 27 and i i went on a trip to brazil to compete and i got stoned for the first time and i came back and i was like man this stuff what have i been missing my whole life so i really like i dived in and like head first and started smoking a lot of weed and i was really high and i was sparring with uh, Felipe at the time and, and my eyes were closed I liked sparring with my eyes closed and I remember like the intensity of this match was getting faster and faster and we were like um, what's that word not tumbling but um, when you're in a like there's no set position you're jockeying for position it's like exchanging what's yeah but there's scrambling. a specific word scrambling that's the word yeah so we were scrambling around and and I remember like in my mind's eye I could see it was almost like we were on this like this ball and we were like chasing each other around this ball of like energy almost like we were trying to like it was uh, it sounds bizarre and then thinking back it's, it sounds crazy but it, i remember like that experience i was like wow there's more to this thing there's more to this thing than us just trying to choke and, and arm lock each other there's there's more to it and, and right at that experience this word this phrase jiu-jitsu brotherhood came into my mind and so i went back that night and i started a blog called jiu-jitsu brotherhood and then I started putting more and more like articles on the blog and it was pretty well, well received. And then I put some uh, videos on YouTube and made an instructional and then it just naturally progressed. I, I, um, I got a business partner that we worked together and then that it really took off. Um, and that's, that's how it was formed. Yeah. And that's, that's how it gathered momentum. Was the goal here to really impact, impact the judicial community with some information or was it, this is more of a, you, trying to project the passion and love that you have in, in all honesty it was a combination of those things and it was like a business decision i was like yeah well let's let's put some stuff out there and like, it was like a it was part of it was a branding you know it was like this is a cool sounding thing and if it, if i can use this as a vehicle to get my my um teaching and my philosophies and what i'm about out there great you know so it it, it did a lot of things for me yeah, because I, I mean, I clearly, I don't know about you, Gary, but I do remember the earlier parts of my journey, looking it up and really looking into it. And like, you know, your name was pretty visible, um, you know, at the beginnings of, of, of my, you know, as I was going through, through, through my growing up on a mat. And, and so I, I do appreciate everything you've done and the impact that you are making. Hence, one of some of the questions I was asking at the beginning, if, you know, how, how this was this impactful how how which direction was this going sometimes we the little things that we do you know the impact is not as visible to us we just do it because we love it so it's great to hear that sure. that converted into a monetary purpose and then allowed you to really have a purpose in life and really you know capitalize on it because end of the day we all need to make money you know right how it's like, <laughs> like, it is what it is it's sure. not necessarily evil yeah. right did you 100%. have you ever thought about the impact that you have made personally with some of the projects and actions that you have taken on the mat besides teaching? Yeah, you know, in all honesty, Thomas, uh, not that much. As of late, I've started to a little bit more. I'm, I'm someone who, for the vast majority of my life, I've been very hard on myself. So, you know, I wouldn't frame things as like, oh, look at everything you've done. It would be more like, damn, you haven't done enough. And as of late, the last couple of years where I've really learned to, to totally love myself and, and, and change the perspective with, with which I look at, at who I am, I've started to realize, you know, that I did influence a lot of people and, and I am part of the body of work that I've put out there for sure. Why do you think that change took place in your life from the point of, you know, loving yourself mm -hmm. more, more so than I haven't done enough? You know, well, I told you about those two pivotal moments. The one was going to Peru yeah. to, to drink ayahuasca and the other one was my divorce. And my divorce was that, that point where I woke up and, and it, I just, uh, it took me to a place. I was so down. I was so lost. I was in so much pain. And I, I, I realized that the root of all of that was because I had put all my self-esteem on another person, you know, like what I thought of myself was all based on what my wife thought of me. And that came from childhood, which was all what I thought of my self-esteem in childhood was all based on was it being a good boy? And my mom was impressed by me. Right. And so 
you know, as an adult, as like a 41 year old man and your wife leaves you, you know, and, and everything you believe about yourself is built around her opinion of you. I realized, fuck, there's something wrong here, right? There's something, there's this disconnect here. And then I started my journey of, of going deeper into, into like, you know, why this happened and, and realized at the root of it all was a lack of self-love and a lack of self-acceptance. How do you be, how do you get to that realization? How do you how do you process that in your mind? And I'm more even referring to oftentimes on the mat, we struggle with things and, and we find to we come to the points of obstacles. And and at times those obstacles put us in a point where we want to quit. We want to leave. We don't want to do this anymore. And yet, mm -hmm. if we don't analyze that and process what is happening then we are giving up what we love and we are not, unable to continue this beautiful thing. So perhaps if you can share some of the experiences, I don't know if, 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 the, if the, does that make sense as far as the question? I think, I think so. Uh, I heard from someone uh, that when, when Steven Spielberg was asked how he chooses projects, because he's always offered so many you know, films to make, especially at this stage in his career, he said, I listen for the whispers. And that's, you know, when, when I was sparring with Felipe at that time, and I, I heard in my mind a whisper, Jiu-Jitsu Brotherhood, right? And when my, my wife left and I was lying on the floor, curled up in, a, in the fetal position, just, just like weeping and devastated, I heard a whisper. It was, love yourself. I heard that, like, just that little voice that, that you know comes from somewhere else. And I've learned in life, if you, if you follow that voice, it will always lead you the right way. And if you don't listen to that voice, you're going to get fucked up. <laughs> like, that's, that's the truth. So, um, in fact, a large part of everything I do, why I meditate for an hour a day and why I'm so focused on, on becoming quiet and, and looking inward is because I'm just trying to get more in touch with that voice because I know that that's the key to everything I want is to be able to hear that voice. Yeah, it's that quietness, that stillness, that, because there's, I, you know, there's so many influences, and you're alone with yourself so much, but you're letting those influences, I think, always affect your, your true self or what you're really thinking. Um, so when you quiet all that noise, it's, it's, it becomes much more evident as to what you really need to do or what you need to say to someone or who you need mm -hmm. to be. Um, so I'm, I'm assuming it was kind of the same way with you as once you could shut all that bullshit off for a little while, uh, even when you were in Peru, um, it helps you admit to who you really are and maybe why you've done the things up to that point that you've done. Yeah. Funny enough, it wasn't actually shutting that bullshit off. It was just the, the, the intensity of those experiences. Like that's what plant medicine does is it's like, you know, there's different ways to get to the truth. There's different paths, right? Just the same way, like there's different ways to go from side control to mount, right? One of them is through quiet. Like now I'm using quiet and solitude and introspection, but plant medicine is another way and extreme pain and discomfort is another way. And one of my mentors always says, he says the cure for, for apathy is discomfort and the cure for extreme apathy is extreme discomfort, right? And, um, yeah, so there's, there's different ways I've, I've heard that voice or different ways I've come to hear that voice. I'd like my lessons in the easiest way possible moving forward. So now I choose, <laughs> I choose silence as opposed to going to the jungle and getting fucked up on plant medicine or <laughs> having my heart broken. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think that's I fair. I, I think that's fair. Completely. Yeah. But I think what's mm -hmm. interesting about this part of the conversation is that many out there today, many out there are seeking this loudness. They are seeking the attention. They, they want to be the center of the attention, whether that's social media or the way how they present themselves you are talking about the op complete opposite the, the quietness the aloneness the self-reflection the meditation is the way to go why do you think these are like these two extremes they're being presented in life today where some seek this well it's all about me and you saying the same thing is just completely opposite direction why is it like that? I'm not sure, man. I think it's, I think the, the egoic mind is kind of out of control. I guess one theory is that the egoic mind is out of control and that it's, it's, um, 
you know, it's the thing that's driving the destruction of our environment, war, uh, this disconnection that most people feel. Um, I don't know if that's true. It's a theory I've heard. It makes sense to me. Uh, and I think, yeah, it's also just the nature of the nature of the world we live in, you know, like you pick up your phone and open Instagram and there's a bunch of people putting the best, most sanitized, polished versions or experiences they've had up there. And then you, yeah. you start to think, Oh, I've got to keep up with them. So you, you, you know, like it's, and you realize it's all artificial. It's all bullshit. Like I, I cannot tell you how many people I open Instagram and see people with like, you know, this like, look at me like on the beach. And I know that their marriage is falling apart and they hate themselves, you know, like, because I know them, I know what's going on behind the scenes. And you just realize that like, it's just all bullshit. You know, it has its place and you can use social media sparingly and use it in a specific way that serves you. But generally, generally it has a, a sort of energy and, and the way it makes me feel I do not enjoy. That's just me. Some people love it. I think I have a good time. I think many share the same thoughts. Um, it is, um, I think it was designed to help us, but the price that we pay for it is, is, is quite large, especially as it continues evolving and as it mm -hmm. continues growing the impact that it has on our lives. Mm -hmm. You've, you've been on the mat for quite a while now. Um, three decades plus, including the judo and other stuff that you've done. I mean, that, that's a very, very, very long time. If you were to pinpoint one of the big evolutions or pivot points, you know, in jiu-jitsu itself, um, what, what would you say would it be? Okay, that's an interesting conversation. One of the big evolutions in jiu-jitsu. Uh, I mean, obviously, the, the first thing that comes to mind is kind of like the, the leg lock mania that that kind of started several years ago with Danaher and, and, and the crew. That's definitely something I've noticed. Um, and also the shift towards Nogi, like that, that was, that was quite a big thing, especially here in America. Nogi is, is gained so much popularity. Um, and obviously, uh, UFC, you know, UFC, when I started UFC was, you know, it was, it was there, but it was very underground or, or very, um, not very established. And then I think after the ultimate fighter came out and UFC just became this, this juggernaut that really increased the popularity of jujitsu. So now, you know, it, it used to be back in the day when I told someone I did jujitsu, they would be like, what's that? And as I'd say, the conversation would usually go something along the lines of, oh, I, do, I teach jujitsu and they'd be like, what's that? I'd say, oh, it's a martial art. So then they would say, well, like karate. And I'd say, no, it's, it's more like wrestling. And then they'd say, oh, like WWE. <laughs> and at that point, I would usually, yeah. At that point, I'd usually just walk away. But um, <laughs> you, you, now, nowadays, that doesn't happen. If I tell someone I teach jiu-jitsu, I'm involved in jiu-jitsu, like, they're like, oh, cool, yeah, I've got a friend who trains, or I train, or do you watch the, the, the last fight? Or, so, like, I, I think it's, it's become a lot more popular and a lot more established, for sure. Let me pick your brain a little bit on the leg lag and Denehar uh, pivot point that you mentioned a moment ago. Do you think that nogi grappling and, and that style of jiu-jitsu is paving the path for the future? So if you look out 10, 15, 20 years from now, do you think that's where, that's, that's where we are going? No, not really. I think it, it works in cycles. It like goes around and comes around and goes around and comes around. I mean, I've, I, I've now been in the game long enough to see things coming back. Right. Like, and I'm like, Oh, like this is the second time I've seen this thing. Right. And if you look at the leg, leg lock craze, you know, leg locks, leg locks have been around forever. You know, Goko Shibichin was actually the pioneer of leg locks. It wasn't Danner. Goko Shibichin brought leg locks to America. And Danner actually learned a lot of them from him. Um, I remember that, uh, a friend of mine was at a seminar and he, he's friends with Goko and he overheard Danaher going to Goko and saying, thank you, man, you really influenced me so much. So, um, we're in kind of the second phase of the leg lock thing. The first one wasn't as big as this one, but there'll be another phase. There'll be like, I don't know, well, like, Guy will come back in fashion. Like, and that's something I think like, I'd like to tell all, all guys listening there when it comes to, to not just jiu-jitsu but life it's this mantra i live my life by which is don't believe the hype just don't believe the hype like there's so much hype in the world and in jiu-jitsu like 
it, it doesn't really serve you. Like by the time you're jumping on that bandwagon, the next one's already coming around, right? Yeah. Like I see that in business as well. Like mm-hmm. it's these people who are like, oh my God, I got to do this new thing. What's a new thing? What's a new thing? And by the time you're at that stage, like copying someone else, it's too late. Mm-hmm. You're not an innovator. You're a copycat. You know, and I, and I really, I've, in my life, I've been a copycat and I don't like it. I don't like the way it makes me feel and I was never proud of myself. So I, don't, I try not to even look at what's, truth is I don't even follow much of what's going on in the jiu-jitsu world. I, I see little bits and pieces and my students and, and training partners will tell me things here and then, but I don't even watch it because that's the primary reason. But also there's a lot of toxicity in it, man. It's, there's really a lot, of, a lot of gross stuff that I just want no part of. You know, it's becoming like, kind of like MMA where there's this kind of like thug mentality and there's people fighting and calling each other names and like, fuck that, man. I'm, I'm just not interested in that. I've got zero interest in that. Yeah, it's interesting that you mentioned mentioning this this evolution or things returning. You know, a while back we had Gordo on the on the show, and obviously we talked about Half Guard and all the other stuff that he's done, and and he mentioned similar things. It's, it's like, first of all, I was not the one that, who developed it. Second, you know, it kind of disappeared, and now it's coming back, or it has came back. Now the leg legs are coming back, so everything is what goes away, comes back. Somebody does re- rediscovers it, improves it, changes it, and so on. There's this new, there's new, there's this new wave. That, that is happening and and if, yeah. we, if we stick around with it long enough we'll see these evolutions come and go come and go i think the yeah. question is do we stick around long enough and sure many, many sure. don't many don't unfortunately mm-hmm. um beautiful beautiful journey of yours again you've been on the mat for so long what where, where where is your life going where where, where where's nag nick heading from this point on what is the future for you? Uh, thank you for asking that, Thomas. So you're at the moment, I'm, I'm focused on uh, one of the issues that I had is I just had too much going on, man. I was just doing doing too many different projects. And, you know, I, I realized that we either operate out of love, we come from a place of love or we come from a place of fear. It's, pre- it's one of the few binary things in life. You either do something because you love it or you do it because you're afraid of something else, right? And I realized that I was doing too much based on fear. And when you split your attention, you split your focus amongst a bunch of different things, it's very rare that any of them gather enough uh, of your attention and subsequently uh, energy to become successful. So I had to really cut everything back and I've scaled back to this. I have two projects. The one is not ready. So it's unrelated to jujitsu so and it's not ready. So I'm not going to speak about it. But the other one is uh, my new association, which is subconscious jujitsu association. And I've been really focused on that for the past couple of years. And it's, it's starting to, you know how it is. It's you plant the seed and then you water it and you nurture it. And then eventually you start to see the growth. And then that's what's happening. It's uh, we just took on our 17th um, uh, affiliate. So it's, you know, and the community is really starting to grow and I'm having so much fun with it. And, and my objective is just, just help these, these guys become the best martial artists, best jiu-jitsu academy owners and best human beings, you know, using what I've learned, my successes, my failures, my own tribulations. You know, I'm just trying to help guide these guys and, and also, you know, we're all growing together. So uh, that's, that's where I'm at at the moment, man. I'm, I'm the director of the subconscious uh, Jiu-Jitsu Association, it, it which had... I run with my. Go ahead. Yeah, after you. Well, I, I run it with my business partner Brent Berniston, who's um an amazing teacher and, and Jiu-Jitsu black belt here in Los Angeles, and we're just having fun, putting good energy out there, just yeah, and and attracting like-minded people. It has to be satisfying to make impact on others from that perspective, sharing your experiences, the good and the bad ones. Longer we hang around, more more thoughts and more uh, these experiences we have, right? And then drawing the conclusions from them and then having the ability to share with others so they can learn from them. That has to be satisfying. Yeah, you know, I've often said that jiu-jitsu is a, it starts out as a very selfish endeavor, right? Because, you know, it is it is all about you. You want to yeah. get better, right? Like, yeah. And then you, you, you compete and you win and you want to get the next belt. And it's, it's very, it it starts out very self-focused and then you get to a point 
just because, I mean, some people arrive there for different reasons. Most of us arrive there from, from age or we reach the ceiling of our ability, right? Like you realize, okay, I'm not going to be a black belt world champion or I'm not going to win the UFC or whatever. You hit this point and then you realize, okay, well, there's nowhere further I can go with the selfish route. Sure, I could get a little bit better and maybe I could evolve my game, but like now it's time. To, the, to me, the solution was to, to turn the, the, the focus from inwards to outwards. I was like, okay, like, let's give back. Let's see how I can, you know, help others get better. And you're right, Thomas, it is an incredibly satisfying thing. It really is like, you know, seeing not just students get better. I love seeing students develop skills and gain a confidence, but like seeing the guys in the association, seeing them, you know, uh, become better teachers, seeing them make more money and seeing their academies grow and just seeing us all grow together. It, it's, it really is a great pleasure because coming back to the beginning of our conversation, it's all, we're all connected, right? So when you help someone else, you're helping yourself. When you hurt someone else, you're ultimately hurting yourself. And in knowing that, <laughs> the intelligent approach is to help others, right? And to, to give as much as you can and, and uh, put more, more good energy out there. I wish more people have this outlook on life. By helping others, I help myself. And by hurting others, I'm hurting myself. I think the world would be a much better place if we all had that general thought in our forefront of our minds as we make our decisions and go through life on a daily basis. It's, it's the, the root, under, that understanding is at the root of, or that the lack of that understanding is at the root of all ills in the world. Yeah. If you know for a fact that through this connection, through the fact that you're connected to everyone and through the laws of karma, that sooner or later, sooner or later, it might not be this lifetime, it might be another lifetime, but sooner or later, everything you do is going to come back to you. Then you just don't hurt other people. You don't lie, you don't cheat, you don't steal, you don't cheat on your girlfriend, you, because you know, like, it's, it's a stupid, short-sighted uh, way of moving through the world. Now, sometimes we still in unintentionally make mistakes, and sometimes we're still human. You know, God knows I've made loads of mistakes and hurt people in my life. But once I came to this understanding, I noticed that that was a very, very, um, another pivot, pivot point is when I, when I realized that, that we're all connected and that karma is a real thing, it, it really improved the quality of my behavior. Like, there's no doubt about it. Like, and uh, that was a painful lesson because a lot of things in my life, my divorce was one of them. It was just stuff coming back to me. It was stuff coming back to me that I, seeds that I'd sown earlier in life, right? So, yeah, I, I, I also wish more people felt that way. And I think more people are starting to feel that way. I think it's, it's changing. I hope so. I hope so. I, think I hope so. A lot of what you're talking about today, we had Drysdale on and he, he talked about martial arts and, you know, we always, <clears throat> excuse me, people always talk about how jujitsu, the cliche is it makes you a better person. And while it can, he also said that uh, it magnifies who you already are. And I think for some of you were just talking about all the ugliness that's in it that you, you don't watch or you don't partake in or even want to see. Uh, and it seems like it's had that, that effect on you where it, it's magnified who you really are to where you are today rather than those others that you're not paying attention to. Do you believe yeah. that statement? Do it's you interesting you say that. Yeah, yeah. It's funny because I was talking to my friend Mike Bidwell, who I think if you haven't had oh, him on yeah, the show, we have him on. Yeah. Uh, okay, yeah, lovely man. Um, and he was saying, like, if you take a douchebag and teach him jiu-jitsu and just teach him jiu-jitsu, then you've just created a douchebag that knows jiu-jitsu, yeah. right? Like, and what's the point of that? Like, you, <laughs> you've just made the world a more dangerous place, not a better place, right? Yeah. So, yeah, I'm, I'm a b big believer in, in, like, and I will call my students out on it. If I see them acting, like, in a, in a way that is hurting others, not just on the map, but, like, if I see them acting in a in a – a selfish or immature way, I will literally like after class, I'll take them into the office and I'll say, man, what are you doing? Like, this is, this is not, not the type of person that you, that, that I know you to be like, you're better than this. And, uh, I think no one likes hearing stuff like that, but ultimately if they're on the right path, they, they learn to appreciate that you call them out. Mm -hmm. yeah, well, sure. what, what do they say? A, a step one of fixing a problem there is identifying there is one and like without hundred percent, without calling these things out and having honest and sometimes harsh conversations, we can't improve as humans. We can't. 
We can sweep things under the rug, ignore them, but the improvement will not take place. Unfortunately, that's part of life. 100%. Man. Nick, we've been at this for almost an hour. Before we before we start wow. wrapping this up, what what um, what we do end of every episode is we have a question for you. But the question comes from our previous <laughs> guest. He asked the question not knowing that you will be answering it. So it's kind of question completely in blind. Mm -hmm. Creates an interesting Smart. end to the conversation. Gary's going to take a lead on this. Um, but this should be a good one. Yeah, and uh, this is from uh, Aiden uh, Sericolo. And uh, he wants to know, at what belt did you learn the most? And it doesn't have to be skill-wise. Easy. Easy one for me. It's uh, at Black Belt. You know, that's... Um, and without question, without question. I mean, I've been a black belt longer than I was all the other belts put together. So just for that reason alone, but also, again, it's so cliched. Oh, black belt is when you really start learning, but it's true. It is. It's when you've, when you've, you're not chasing the belt anymore. You put all that shit aside and then you're like, wow, okay, what am I going to do with this thing? So definitely a black belt. So let me ask you a follow-up question. Why so many students chase, let me rephrase, not chase, but why is the black belt? a hyper-focused goal for so many versus the moment we get there, we no longer care about it. And no matter how, no matter who we ask on the show, that question that everybody says the same thing, the journey starts from the beginning. I'm learning the most the moment I received it, the moment that rank, rank was around my waist. Why does that happen? I mean, as humans, we... <laughs> one of the shitty parts of our, our biology is that we, we seek status, right? We're status seeking um, mammal, right? And having a black belt does confer a certain level of status on a person. And uh, it is also our tendency. It's our default to chase things in the future. And when you put those two things together, something in the future, that's going to give you status, like, I mean, it's natural. I don't blame anyone. I mean, I was that guy. I was desperate to get my black belt. Uh, to answer the question as to why do, do most guys get there and then realize um, it's, it's, you know, the most important thing was the journey. I think it's just a, it's just a maturity. And, and just you have to, it's like that thing that parents tell me. It's like you want the best for your kids. You don't want them to make the mistakes that you made. Yeah. But Unfortunately, the fact is they're just going to go and make the mistakes, right? You can't really stop them from doing it. And it's only once they've made the mistakes do they go, oh, shit, dad was right. You know, and it's, it's kind of like the same thing. Like I can, I've got this one student, shout out to Robert Upton. Um, <laughs> he, he is convinced. He is convinced everything is going to be okay when he's a black belt. He's a purple belt now. When he was a blue belt, he was so desperate for that purple belt. He was like, that was his reason for being. And I said to him, I was like, man, Nothing's going to change. Nothing is going to change when you get that purple belt. And he got the purple belt, and now he wants the brown belt. And I said to him, man, <laughs> do you think it's going to be any different this time or when you get your black belt? Do you think, do you think all your problems are going to be solved? Do you think it's just going to be like you, you've got superpowers? Nothing is going to change. But um, he doesn't want to believe me, right? But he, he will one day. He'll come to me, and he'll say, oh, you were right. And that, that's just human nature, I guess. Yeah, that's a... Uh... Ongoing yeah. conversation uh, with my can't. kids. <laughs> 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 right. But that's what makes us humans and that's what makes life interesting in a way, right? We have to go through these mm -hmm. discoveries. We have to go through these acknowledgements. But we can't go through them without making the mistakes because mistakes is what makes us acknowledge these things. It's a vicious circle. That's part of life, part of learning. 100%. Good stuff. It's a, actually a, a, virt a virtuous circle, I would say. Yeah. I agree. Not a vicious circle. Yeah. I yeah. I agree. I agree. I agree. Nick, before we wrap this up, anybody wants to connect with you? You're doing a lot of cool stuff. You have some projects that you didn't talk about yet. Where, where, where can anybody find you? Where they can connect with you? How they can get in touch with you if anybody likes to? Yeah, it's easy. It's coachnickg.com. And so that's coachnickg.com. Pretty simple. Pretty simple. Um, as always, we'll include all the notes, all the links in the show notes so you guys can check it out, connect with Nick if you choose to do so, if you like to connect with him, and um, if you like to visit him, same thing. Gary? Yeah, I love these um, these 
deep, deep conversations. Yeah. yeah. Philosophical yeah. is the word I was trying to say. <laughs> um, and I, I think they're important. I think they're so much more important than the, uh, the, what I've won conversations. Yeah. Um, so thank you for that. I appreciate it. Uh, and I, I think that people are going to get a lot out of this episode uh, and hopefully it's going to help them grow. So thank you, Nick. Thank you guys. I appreciate you both. Thank you for being here. Thank you for spending last hour with us. Thank you for sharing your wisdom and everything that you do for jujitsu community. As always, it was great hanging out and chatting with you. Thank you for listening to Raw Radio. If you enjoyed the show, don't forget to leave us a review and help us make the show even more amazing. For future episodes, check out our website and follow us on all major podcast platforms. Take care.